Very good. Thanks again, staff. Uh, we move on now to bylaws for marijuana-related businesses. And I'm going to ask our folks from Legislative Services to walk us through uh, the report. And our Planning Department. Good morning, Mayor Helps, members of Council. <clears throat> Excuse me, Chris Coates, I'm the City Clerk. And uh, with me is, of course, my colleague, the Director of Sustainable Planning and Community Development, Jonathan Tenney. And to reintroduce and welcome back from paternity leave is uh, Emily Gorman, our Policy Analyst in Legislative Services. So we're here to, uh, we have a brief PowerPoint uh, presentation for you that Ms. Gorman is going to take Council through. And it really just steps forward from Council's May 12th direction, um, highlighting the issues that Council asked uh, for further regulatory considerations to be brought forward. Uh, so the report before you on today's agenda uh, addresses those things. And Ms. Gorman will, will take you through the, the brief PowerPoint and uh, will be available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Coates. Good morning, Ms. Gorman. Good morning, uh, Mayor and members of Council. Uh, I just have a brief presentation today on the report and the proposed bylaws before you as this issue has been before Council a number of times. Um, so a bit of background. On May 12th, Council directed staff to proceed with zoning bylaw amendments prohibiting marijuana retailers and businesses that allow the consumption of marijuana in all zones in the city. Uh, Council also directed that we bring forward bylaws to establish, re establish regulations pertaining to marijuana-related businesses, to bring forward proposed ticket bylaw fines for those proposed regulations, to provide further details and staffing impl implications specifically to the planning and bylaw departments, and to prepare additional amendments concerning advertising prohibitions and add a 200-meter buffer um, for licensed daycare facilities from the marijuana retailers. I would just wanted to highlight a few issues that are new in this particular report that have not been highlighted in previous presentations or discussions. So in response to Council's direction to prohibit advertising except for minimal storefront front, uh, signage, staff has looked into what other jurisdictions have done specifically related to some tobacco regulations that have quite stringent um, advertising restrictions, so we propose that there are two signs maximum, and this is for the outside of the premises, that there are no images contained on the signs, that they be alphanumeric only, containing only the business name, and then otherwise follow the rules already contained in the sign bylaw. So this would be things like in different sign zones, there are restrictions for size um, and that type of thing. The additional uh, item proposed by council was to add a 200 meter buffer zone around child, uh, licensed childcare facilities. So you see in the map here that the red dots are the current retailers that we are aware of with a 200 meter zone. Um, difficult to see uh, a little bit, but the pink dots are the licensed childcare facilities that are currently licensed uh, with city business licenses. Um, we are recommending that council actually not include this in the in the policy and the reason for that is that it greatly reduces the number of uh, locations that are available to the retail locations as well it was felt that there was probably very minimal exposure risk to children particularly given that there is no consumption permitted on site and that there will be no outdoor advertising so from the outside it will be very um, you know very little that shows what the um, what is contained within within the premises in terms of a child being able to know what is what is contained there. Uh, other changes that I would just like to highlight as well, there was some discussion about compassion clubs and whether these should be treated differently. Um, in the bylaw, it is difficult to highlight um, these particular businesses. There are two long-standing ones that are contained within the community. There is some difficulty in highlighting nonprofit status. It's, it can be problematic in that many businesses might choose to go that route that are not just the compassion clubs. Um, so we suggest that we either allow these businesses to simply operate as a consultant only, as that is perfectly um, within our business license bylaw, or to go through the same process as other marijuana-related businesses, which would be the same process uh, and the same fees. And in the report, there are highlighted some other options, which include a, a grant to offset the $5,000 business license fee, or that the city initiate the rezoning on their behalf with their participation, obviously, in providing the documentation that that requires. Uh, it, previous discussion did center also around one business license per location. This was to restrict that no cafes or entertainment or coffee shops be 
you know, contained within the same business. This does restrict, however, and we did want to highlight that there will be no vending machines then as a result. Uh, each vending machine in the city does require its own business licenses. Business license, so that means no vending machines or ATMs, and some businesses do have these. Lots of them operate as a cash-only business, so they, for their convenience, their customers do have cash machines inside. Um, uh, the last item was the community and land use. Caluk, I can never remember that it's community land use association land use committees. Uh, there's some discussion about what uh, impacts that would have to these committees to have this many uh, applications going forward. It was felt that because many of these businesses are in existing buildings, that no community meetings would be required. Um, however, if a new building was proposed, it would go through the Caluk um, process. And then so just the next steps are to uh, give readings or approvals and principles to the bylaws and policy. There is required consultation in that the public hearing will be required for the zoning bylaw amendments. We are required to consult with businesses. We'd like to focus on the changes that have happened since previous consultation. This would be our third time going out to businesses. This felt it would be more useful to concentrate our consultation and communication efforts on what the expectations will be once these are approved to inform businesses as much as possible. Um, I, but still to come back to staff to council in September for the public hearing and the consultation results of what we did here from businesses specifically around the advertising uh, limits and then obviously the next step are to the financial and staffing implications to amend financial plans and begin staffing up in preparation. So that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we'll start with questions. Okay, yeah, Councillor Lucas, Councillor Thornton Joe. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, just a question around the 200 meter for the child care facilities. Um, are you saying that? that that totally go away or, or is it open to reducing it to 100 meters or does that still create a real problem in the downtown core if it was at 100? Uh, through Mayor House, it's it's uh, it is a policy consideration, and certainly um, you know even if it remains in council, can still make decisions as they as they see fit. But um, staff were uh, trying to look at the intent of, of of what is trying to be achieved with these buffer zones. I think the overall intent is that we don't see an accumulation of these businesses all in one in particular area, as well that there is some protection of of, of youth, uh, similar to the kinds of protections that we provide for for liquor like, uh, liquor sales out. And so when we looked at the sort of daycare, those youth, uh, you know, um, uh, attending a daycare facility uh, are not necessarily the ones that we, that, that, that we are concerned would find a way to uh, enter into these businesses. Um, and uh, that, um, so some of those provisions I think would, uh, would I think complicate the process. Um, really, I think it, it makes more sense to focus on uh, youth in, in older age groups, school age uh, groups. Um, and, and uh, uh, remove this consideration. Thank you. Um, I know this is this question is a bit of a what ifs, but for instance, say if when the uh, federal government brings in their guidelines um, in the next year or so, um, and they do determine that it's a hundred meters from a child care center. Will we be looking, how, how are we going to be able to, uh, to uh, so two of them maybe are within. Is it a first come, first serve, whoever got there first and the other one has to go? Like how, how are we, because we don't know what those guidelines are. They could be very different from the guidelines that we put in. So how do we fairly decide who will be able to stay under some of those guidelines? Is it the first come? The intent of the process from a rezoning perspective is that um, uh, that, that staff would look at a sort of a, a uh, an ordered process where applications would come through specifically within this first tranche where we anticipate getting uh, applications from all 38 or so current businesses. So staff will look at an, uh, a process whereby we will uh, move them through the process in an orderly fashion. Um, again, the, the rezoning policy is just simply policy. It is providing some guidance to 
to uh, to counsel in their determination of the rezoning. Um, if in the instance in this first tranche, if we did see two businesses who happen to be in close proximity to each other, staff uh, could make the decision and, and, and likely would make the decision to bring both of those forward to counsel at the same time. So counsel can make considerations uh, and work with both of those applicants to look at ways to mitigate the impacts of, of, of their distance from each other. Um, th there is flexibility in that process. The daycare process, uh, the daycare um, consideration provides a bit of a wrinkle um, because daycares are permitted in a number of our different uh, commercial zones. And so uh, while council could consider uh, the proximity of a daycare when a marijuana business moves in, it's very likely that a daycare could move in within the 200 meter zone, um, <clears throat> excuse me, after that marijuana business is then approved. And so does that, uh, does that pose some problem to us in the future? And so again, we looked at it from a practical perspective in the sense of, you know, who are the youth that we are, are trying to protect through the regulation? Uh, those youth, uh, you know, under the age of five uh, who are attending uh, daycare are not typically the ones who, who would be impacted given that there's no consumption on site uh, within the bylaw and that uh, signage is, is, is minimized. Um, and so our recommendation would be that, that the daycare uh, distance provision is one that uh, could potentially be removed. Thank you. I have uh, Councilor Thornton Joe and then myself with questions. Uh, thank you. Um, my questions, I have a few questions. One, and just a reminder, I'm not sure if I saw the report. Uh, there had to be, I think there's somewhere that says there has to be two staff, one being a manager. Um, is there anything in the report or anything that says that um, they have to have had a, a criminal record check? Uh, through your worship, yes, there was a provision originally that there had to be two members on site, and there was an, a, a separate one that said that all staff above an on site manager had to have a criminal record check. We have now added that one of the people on site has to have had a criminal record check. So we are making sure that there are two staff on site, one of which at least has had a criminal record check, and that is within the proposed bylaw business regulation. Okay, thank you. My, my second question is, um, you know, when I look at some of the letters we receive that sometimes uh, um, are in opposition of, of uh, us having retail for marijuana dispensaries, uh, my question is, what responsibility does the owner of a building have? So we have, so, so we deal with the leasee. But often, you know, uh, when people say there's a proliferation of uh, marijuana dispensaries opening, we're not opening them. Uh, we're not saying that they they should be, op uh, or, you know, that uh, we want them in every block. So, what responsibility do owners of the buildings have in saying, you know, if they if they're leasing their properties to to these dispensaries or leasing their property to two in one building? You know, I just wonder where. Uh, whether it's education, whether it's communication, whether it's um, some responsibility as well of the owners of the building, or is it just that they're getting rent and, and that's favorable to them? And that may be a philosophical question, but just uh, curious. Through my helps, um, so it sort of highlights some of the difficulties with, with a tenancy-based operation in the first place, I think, and so um, certainly... Um, you know, in the, in the in a situation where an owner of a property ha, uh, is entering into a rental or, or a lease arrangement with with another operator, they have exclusivity, of course, in terms of making a decision about whether or not this is the type of operation that they want to have on on their property or within their within their building. And um, so, the difficulty outside of the regulations, because the city has none right now, is um, they're sort of no rules around what that looks like. If council chooses to implement these regulations or or variations on these regulations, and certainly in terms of the zoning piece, um, that that sets out immediately whether or not this type of operation can can go on that property. And so there is that definitive role for the city should council move the the zoning matter forward. And then and so that's sort of at the head of all the decision making there. And then in terms of the regulations, it's after that. But I think that um, so there's that piece. And then there's always the flexibility and discretion amongst the property owner as to whether or not they want to have this sort of operation going on on their property. OK, thank you. And my last question is uh, the the, the daycare that was concerned. 
uh, one of the things they express is that uh, the dispensary that is in their proximity of 200 meters um, not only um, has has you know the signage is is uh, very clear what it is they have karaoke and they do consumptions so my understanding that uh, if this business it was to continue, the signage would be changed, there would be no consumption, and they would not be able to have uh, entertainment like karaoke or, or a social, social smoking hour. Or, uh, and also the concern is the aroma, so they would have to also deal with issues of that. So it's my understanding with this bylaw that would alleviate um, a majority of these concerns? Through my helps, that's correct, and, and certainly in terms of the consumption, the, the, the bylaw is, is very specific and straightforward that consumption on premises is not permitted in any of these situations. Uh, and and as, uh, as you characterize, Councillor Thornton Joe, that yes, the, the advertising requirements uh, would have to be uh, brought into compliance with the, the very minimalistic regulations that Council has before them to consider. So I think that, that those. The regulations in the current form as they're proposed for council to consider would, would address those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I have a number of questions. I'll start with the easiest one first. Um, at the public uh, town hall that we held on this and also some correspondence we've received since, uh, some people have suggested that we should be calling this cannabis because uh, it's the proper plant name and also because marijuana has some racist connotation. So how difficult would it just be to call everything the cannabis bylaw, cannabis storefront bylaw at this point? So we just received more correspondence on this recently, so that's why I'm raising it now. Through you, Mayor Helps, I don't, I don't think that, that we have a definitive answer. Um, in terms of changing the bylaw before council were to give it readings, that's not difficult. I, I think we'd have to take a quick look at whether there's any other um, implications that would be affected by that. Uh, it doesn't seem like it, but uh, we'd have to put a bit of due diligence into making those sorts of determinations because, um, you, you know, bylaws being legal documents and, and this one in particular, I think we'd want to be careful that we were um, hitting the mark with the terminology. Absolutely. Okay. So maybe that will come later as an amendment. Um, so now I have my, I think, what are more substantive questions. Um, on page 6 of 10 of the report, um, it, it lays out the proposal that people uh, selling cannabis would pay a $5,000 storefront uh, retailer fee and people giving advice or, um, you know, selling paraphernalia would pay a $500 fee. Um, some of the dis dispensaries that are open now started to allegedly consult and are now selling cannabis. So how do we prevent someone from just paying $500 and then doing, um, I, I mean, uh, what, what are the steps to mitigate that? I mean, I guess how we prevent is enforcement, but how do we mitigate someone saying, oh yeah, all I need to pay is $500 a year because I'm just consulting, but then two days later, which has happened now, they're actually selling uh, cannabis. So certainly that's part of the uh, part of the ongoing and and I think particularly proactive initial period once um, if council gives consideration to these regulations and enacts them um, certainly that the front end piece of um, getting these businesses up and running both from the land use application perspective and and once that's done through the business licensing perspective there would be a, a significant amount of upfront um, uh, conversation and an on-site review about how the business is being operated and certainly um, the reason why uh, the report and, and the recommendations uh, have consistently um, brought forward the notion that there should be an extra um, staff person on the bylaw services team uh, to simply to manage this this sort of activity is that we would anticipate uh, being frequent visitors to the properties to make sure that they are compliant with all of the regulations that are in place? So, for example, if someone said, I only need to pay $500 for my annual business license because I'm just going to consult, and then our bylaw officer goes and finds out they're indeed selling cannabis, do we just charge them $4,500 or for the remainder of the proper fee? Certainly, uh, I suppose in the... Um in the enforcement scheme and, and following the city's standard processes, we look to achieve compliance with the requirements. And, and so uh, I would say that we probably haven't put our mind to that very specific situation, but uh, it would generally 
uh, result in that the outcome would be yes, that's what we'd be looking to achieve. And then if we weren't able to achieve that payment, then we have other uh, remedial actions we could take under the authority of the business licensing bylaw. Okay, and sorry, this is probably laid out in the report, but um, do even the people who, sorry, is it only the storefront retailers who need to go through a rezoning process or do the consultancies also need to go through a rezoning process? Through Mayor Helps, uh, you know, uh, consultation uh, is a permitted use within the zone and, and uh, isn't covered within the changes uh, per, uh, referred to here. The sale of, of marijuana is, is what is considered here, and that is the use that would be made uh, non-conforming and would require a rezoning process. Okay, I think that this is something we're going to need to watch very carefully. Um, I have another question now with regard to distance. And it's actually in the language of the council policy um, on page, I guess, page two of the policy, um, section C3. Uh, storefront marijuana retailer should be at least 200 meters from another where a storefront marijuana re uh, retailer is permitted. Whether or not a storefront marijuana retailer is active or not, a reduced distance may be warranted in locations such as a lar large urban village, town center, or downtown. I don't think we should have discretionary. I, I guess why do we have discretionary language? Because it feels like it's a repeat of the liquor licensing policy where there's discretion and then it just gets all muddy. So why isn't it crisp? I mean, there probably is a good reason, but I'd like to know why. Through our helps, it, it simply provides some some uh, opportunity where you know, especially in the downtown core, where we have a significant concentration of, of retail, where you know a 200 meter uh, buffer would would encapsulate a number of uh, you know sort of a, a relatively large area, um, and that uh, it give, provides some some flexibility for uh, for council uh, in in looking at uh, situations whereby uh, that distance may be slightly uh, less than than uh, exactly 200 meters. Again, this is meant to be policy. It is, it is some guidance for staff, uh, guidance for applicants, uh, but does not in any way uh, fetter uh, council's discretion uh, in, in actually making the decision around the rezoning. Okay, I, I guess I'll save my response to that for comments because it is a comment. Um, did staff consider uh, one distance for outside of the downtown and one distance for inside the downtown in terms of distances between retailers? Uh, through our helps, no. We again, we largely use the the template uh, for uh, the uh, sort of liquor uh, sales uh, policy that we have. Um, you know, understanding that that the sale of marijuana has some similar uh, aspects to this, the the sale of of liquor in in that sense, and so we've utilized that. Um, that is that you know. There isn't necessarily a there's there's nothing stopping council or, or, or staff for uh, for looking at those issues. There's not uh, spelled out specifically in, in the uh, in the guidelines. Okay, uh, and then my final question for now is um, back to the report, not the policy or the bylaw. It it lays out. Um, I actually I just I want to make sure I understand and then ask a question. So we bring um, these changes in. Uh, all of the existing dispensaries then immediately need to, or within a, a I think, grace period of 30 days, um, need to conform to the operating requirements, the security requirements, et cetera, even as they're going through the rezoning process. Is I guess is that is that the case? Through humor helps. Yes, that's correct. And so, just for clarity, too, that um, demonstrating progress toward that end is also uh, something that would be looked at in terms of whether or not part of the whole forward progression process. But yes, they they'd be asked to be compliant with the current regulations. So they'd be asked to be compliant with the current regulations, even while they're going through a rezoning process in order to become legitimately zoned. Correct. That's correct. Okay, and so. Now, this is a very tricky question because we're regulating for land use, right, not the operator. But I want to know, um, will staff, when they're bringing a re recommendation to council for a rezoning, will the, whether or not the operator has actually come into compliance, is that a factor that council will be able to consider? That might be more of a question for Mr. Zaworski. Yeah, just, is my question clear, first of all, before you... Mr. Zaworski. Uh, Mayor Helps, uh, 
first, uh, uh, just to clarify, the proposed regulations are, uh, there are two uh, uh, proposed bylaws, one which relates to zoning and land use, the other one which relates to business operation. And so the, it's the, I'm sorry, it's the business operation uh, a component that businesses would have to uh, comply with uh, immediately except for the security requirements which would uh, be triggered within 60 days of the uh, adoption of the bylaw for the existing businesses. Uh, on the rezoning uh, consideration, uh, you are absolutely correct that, that the land use consideration relates to the use of land, not the user. However, uh, under some circumstances, council is able to consider in a rezoning process the past enforcement history um, of the, uh, uh, in relation to the property and whether the rezoning is being done um, to correct uh, uh, prior non-compliance. Uh, so it's a very difficult question to answer in general terms. It would have to be sort of evaluated on a case-by-case -case specific instances. But yes, if we had an applicant who, after these bylaws, assuming they're adopted in, a, in their current form, uh, has failed to comply and there is a adverse history of uh, enforcement uh, by the city, and then eventually this applicant comes for a rezoning, it is something that council could consider. Okay, thank you very much. So if there are two applicants side by side within a 200 meter buffer, staff can't, staff will just, as Mr. Tinney said earlier, staff will just bring them both forward for council's consideration. But if one came into compliance and, and you know, when the new regulations were passed and the other didn't, that is something that we can legitimately consider in, as part of our land use evaluation. Mr. Zorski? <laughs> um, Sorry. You're popular. Under, under some, uh, uh, again, I, I'm a little bit hesitant offering a sort of a blanket uh, general answer, but yes, under some circumstances, uh, there is case law authority that suggests that council can consider prior uh, enforcement history uh, as part of a rezoning process. Okay. So okay. under some circumstances, it may be possible. Uh, under other circumstances, may not be. So I, I, it's very difficult for me to, to give a general uh, blanket answer. Uh, but it is certainly uh, a, a possible that the scenario, for example, where it clearly would be possible would be an instance where one business applies for a rezoning, the other one does not, and only after the city uh, initiates enforcement they seek a rezoning. That would be an instance where uh, a council could consider the prior history. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Mr. Uh, Coates, did you want to add something as a follow-up? Thank you. Uh, through your helps, I think the, f the footnote to this too is that council does have the clean hands policy in place and so um, as part of any uh, land use application process that council is going to consider, if there are known bylaw violations on, on the property, um, that policy uh, is brought to council's attention and council can consider waiving the policy and, and having the application proceed or, or can also use that as part of the consideration. So I think in concert with Mr. Zworski's comments that more particularly and specifically to note that that's definitely part of the package that staff will be bringing forward to council to consider because that policy is there and because we will be uh, closely monitoring all of the applicants. So there'll be clarity from council's perspective about what, what they're giving consideration to. Okay, thank you very much, council. Uh, yes, Councillor Loveday with questions. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for this thorough report. Uh, got a number of questions. <clears throat> uh, first, is, have we received any contact from the federal government? Any guidance at this point? No, through my helps, no. I'll have comments on that for sure. Um, I'm wondering, can you explain the, the rationale for no ATMs? Through my helps. So, um, in the city's current business licensing bylaw, um, uh, an ATM machine is uh, something which is specifically licensed under that bylaw. And so the business regulation bylaw that council has before you for consideration doesn't um, supersede that. And so that, that's still a requirement that, um, and, and I assume that's been one that's been around for some time, is that each ATM 
regardless of where it is, has to have a specific license. So that just carries that along. And so along with any other business licensing requirements that are currently in place that relate to other businesses. So, but specific to that, um, they're required under the bylaw now, and this bylaw doesn't change that. So could still having trouble understanding it. So would so for example, if a bar has a has an ATM in it, they they have to get a special permit. Through my helps, I think that what it is is that it's a separate business license. So there's a fee for that for that ATM, and there's so uh, so if they have a any kind of facility that has one in, on their premises has the primary license for for what their business generally is, and then they have a secondary uh, business license for that ATM. And <clears throat> do we have any idea if uh, how compliant? businesses are in terms of having special business licenses for ATMs across the city? Through my help, so I don't have the data in front of me. I, it's certain that something that staff could, could look at and, and bring forward. Um, and I don't think that at this point we'd be able to provide much clarity on how successful that is. Certainly, it, you know, the more um, obscure the, the regulations be, are, <laughs> the more difficult they are to enforce. Okay, and so if, but they could have a, you know, a debit machine point of sale and give cash back, any business could without a business license? That's, that's correct. I think that the business licensing bylaw would define specifically what, a, what an ATM is and, uh, and that the, uh, the transactional debit machine uh, wouldn't be covered by that. Okay, and in terms of the... Uh, the not, in, not allowing inhalation uh, at on at any of these sites. So if that, I, I get that that's something. So if you're buying it there, you can't smoke it there, inhale it there. So for what if there was a, a lounge? So that's in this these changes that would not be allowed. Um, just through my help. So. The proposed zoning regulations are quite clear around the notion that consumption of marijuana on premises is banned in any zone, and so that's the that's the purpose of the of the zoning amendment bylaw before you. So, um, what if the lounge was a what if it was a private club? Would that be captured? Uh, through more helps, and I think again the answer is the same. That um, so the consumption of marijuana on premises in any zone um, is banned, and so I, I think that applies. Maybe Mr. Zorsky can add some more light on that. Sorry, just to clarify, it's uh, uh, the combined effect of the two bylaws would be to prohibit consumption on, on the premises, but it wouldn't be done through zoning. Zoning deals with the retail uh, so the only thing that, that the zoning, the proposed zoning bylaw does, it, uh, it prohibits uh, storefront marijuana retailers in all zones unless uh, expressly permitted, which is what would trigger requirements for rezoning. So a lounge that, or a private club that is currently, or, or that would be located in a zone that permits it, uh, would not require a rezoning. However, under the business license, bylaw amendments that are being proposed, it would, be, it would fall in the category of a marijuana-related business and would be subject to those regulations that are set out in the proposed bylaw, which are not as strenuous for businesses that simply are marijuana-related businesses but are not retailers or do not possess marijuana on the premises. So what the business license bylaw has proposed has, it has three different categories of businesses, those that are marijuana related businesses which captures everybody secondly those that have marijuana on the premises which is more uh, additional security uh, provisions and then the marijuana retailers which has further regulations and requirements both related to security hours of operations etc so uh, it is a rather uh, so so the on-site consumption uh, currently or under proposed bylaws is not permitted. Okay, so 
go into the hypothetical here a bit, though. Um, so we're there's a say a medical cannabis patient who's going through chemotherapy and can't lives in an apartment, can't smoke in their apartment, and they want a safe place to uh, take their medicine. Where do we envision them going? Through my helps, I think, um, I don't think that there's necessarily, this work is, is providing the opportunities. Rather, it's sort of providing the restrictions around where, where things are, are not permitted. So the, the business, the proposed business regulation bylaw before you is, is explicit that any um, marijuana-related business must not allow the vaping or smoking or consumption of marijuana products on the property. So. Uh, if it's in a non-business environment, um, I, I suppose that's a general answer to the question. But I think that it's important to, to note that that the work that um, that's been done and, and the focus here is is the regulation of business and not sort of the the access folks have to um, opportunities to um, to use substances for for medical purposes or otherwise. So if there was a, a non-profit lounge, that would not be, that, that wouldn't be inhibited by these uh, business bylaw changes? Through my helps, I think the, probably the best answer I could provide to that question is that if it's not captured under the city's business regulation bylaw, either this version or the, or the broader version where it's, it's not a business, then um, I suppose that, that creates an opportunity. Thank you. Um, wondering about the criminal record check. So I, I, I get that they'll have uh, one play will have to get a criminal record check, but what is that? Uh, so what if it comes back that they have a criminal record? Does that, how does, what is, what actually happens? Uh, through Mayor Helps, these, this provision that criminal record checks are conducted is standard in all our business licensing processes. It's to capture things such as if someone has a, an offense for, let's say, credit card violations and they want to open a retail business, it's to protect consumers from items such as that. In terms of this, uh, if, if a conviction was found, it's difficult to allow a conviction for certain um, drug offenses related to marijuana, which we are now permitting, and then also not allow for drug offenses related to other currently banned substances, and maybe Mr. Zorski can expand on that, but it, it'll, it allows some opportunity to look at what the offenses have been and, and accordingly um, judge the business license viability. So if, if someone had a marijuana-related offense, would they be disqualified from now operating a cannabis dispensary? According to the bylaw, we certainly have that discretion. I think that's something that we'll look in. We're not sure exactly how many of these will occur at the current time. Um, when someone applies for a business license, it's information that would come forward. Um, I, I, yeah, I think um, just following up on that, um, that, that generally the provisions have more to do with awareness than they do about um, whether or not a, a business is, is approved. And so it creates awareness for... Um, for the city, it creates awareness for the uh, the proprietor and it, and it, and generally the public as well. And so, um, I think it's something that we'll have to give some further consideration to about um, uh, you know the um, whether or not the significance of a particular issue is is, is such that it warrants uh, a further discussion with the proprietor and and whether it has an impact on the license. I just don't think uh, that we have clarity of the answer on that question at this point. So, to, is, uh, so anyone who gets a business license has to do a criminal record check? Is that? I think the question is anyone who gets a general business license of any nature, not specifically with regard to these. Through my helps, I think, um, I think in general that's probably not the case, and I think probably the, the context of the remark was that in, in terms of this particular uh, component of the this marijuana related business regulation bylaw, but I don't think that each proprietor of every business in the city is is going to be in a position where they're doing that. No, no. right. So, the, 
so when when we when that information is found out and whether or not they have a record so that will be collected and then there's some discretion there as to whether or not to give a business license Mr. Zaworski uh, Mayor Hopes if I may um, I think uh, I, I, I have to confess I can't immediately recall uh, our general provisions of, of our business license bylaw but it is a very common uh, provision to allow the uh, uh, license inspector to refuse to issue a business license uh, where there is a conviction uh, of, of uh, a relevant nature to the type of the business that is being proposed. That doesn't mean that every applicant has to submit a record check, but rather that there is a discretion if there has been a conviction in the last five years typically. So a classic example, of course, is, has to do with chauffeur permits for taxi drivers. Um, and in that context, as, a, as an example, uh, if, uh, if, the, if the person was convicted of, say, a, a drunk driving offense, that would be something that would be a basis for a chief constable in, in that instance to refuse to issue a chauffeur permit. Uh, similarly, in the context of uh, the proposed bylaw, uh, this is to enable uh, the city some discretion and ability to prevent uh, among other things, uh, organized crime from uh, uh, using the, uh, the marijuana retail businesses. So as an example, I would imagine uh, uh, that the, a single conviction for possession of marijuana in the past might not be uh, a basis for refusing a business license, but repeat uh, uh, trafficking offenses uh, as part of some kind of organized uh, uh, crime operation would be a basis for refusing a business license. Um, it does provide discretion to the chief uh, license inspector to do that. Right, so it, it's the discretion is of the chief license inspector. Okay. Um, in, in have, what would the, in, so once, once the first Tranche, is that the word we're using? Um, it, it comes forward. Uh, what would what do we imagine it, it looks like when we have applications within the 200 meters in terms of enforcement? And uh, sorry, in terms of enforcement or in terms of approval? Approval and then enforcement. Uh, I think in terms of approval, uh, as I said, we, we do have a number of those businesses who are within close proximity be, uh, of each other uh, currently. Um, you know, staff will look at those. Uh, as I say, probably the approach may be to bring those uh, forward to council uh, in, in together so that council can consider those uh, those distance issues at the same time and make some determination uh, how close they are, um, you know, the fact that they are uh, existing businesses. All of those are th things that uh, uh, potentially um, um, council could take into, into some consideration. But, um, you know, we, we would have to look at those individual instances. Um, in terms of enforcement, once those are approved, the distance between them uh, doesn't wouldn't trigger an enforcement requirement if, if council decided that uh, that uh, two businesses were allowed to be 150 meters from each other, uh, that, that wouldn't trigger any sort of need for enforcement. I'm just trying to understand everything. It's complicated. Yeah, Take so, the time you need. So we, if we approve two within 200 meters, then it, there's no enforcement. Uh, Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to figure it out. I mean, essentially, I don't want, I don't want, uh, I don't want our police to be raiding all these things and people getting arrested, and it looked like Toronto um, uh, a couple months back. And you know, so I think there is enforcement, but I that, that may be needed. But just want to make sure we know what that is. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are there more questions? Yeah, Councillor Coleman. Thank you. Um, and, and first of all, the one business license per um, location, I think, got sidetracked into it's a battle against ATMs, or at least that's the way I interpret it. My understanding is we wanted to put only one license in a locate one business license in a location, um, and that's our choice. And it captured 
as a consequence, ATMs. We were actually targeting something else. If we did, as an example, one business license only for an apartment block, it would mean they couldn't have any coin-operated washers or dryers because those are licensed separately. So I, I don't think it's a war on ATMs. Um, it's saying we want biz one business operator. Is that correct? Dear Mr. Helps, yes, that's certainly the, the approach is that in the case of marijuana retailers, is that is the only business that takes place on the, on the premises. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to clear that up because I thought we were going down a, a, a different path on that one. Um, I guess maybe it's from Mr. Zaworski. Um, the concern I have is we still don't know exactly where the federal government's going. So we could see a very different landscape. If we proceed with this at the moment, is there a possibility that we will go through a public hearing process, uh, give an entitlement to one or a number of operators, and then find that the federal landscape has changed in nuance, but there's still this gray area where we have given a grandfathered entitlement to applications that we've endorsed. Is, is that a possibility? And it may be very difficult to answer without specific details, but... Uh, Mayor Hopes, I, I think it, it certainly is a difficult question to answer without knowing what the federal government will do. Uh, it, but I can perhaps start with a couple of general uh, statements. Firstly, the concept of grandfathering applies only in the uh, zoning uh, context. Uh, so, so insofar as council may be asked, uh, there will be, assuming these bylaws are adopted, uh, applications for rezonings. If council makes a decision that this is an appropriate land use in a particular location and grants a rezoning, then yes, from the land use perspective, the operator then acquires the right to operate a marijuana retail store at that location. It's not so much grandfathering as in the city has allowed it through the zoning process. Um, and presumably, uh, it would not be a problem because the underlying premise of a rezoning is that council reaches a, a decision that, that is an appropriate land use in that location. And it's not likely that federal regulations would have any impact on that. Insofar as our business, the proposed business regulations on how these businesses are, are, are to operate, um, the uh, uh, relationship between the municipal bylaws and regulations or laws by other levels of government, whether it's a provincial or federal laws, are uh, we are kind of at the bottom of the of the, the pyramid here. Uh, the federal government laws uh, are paramount over provincial laws, and provincial legislation is paramount over uh, municipal bylaws. But it, it only is relevant if there is a conflict between the two, and the conflict generally is uh, defined where it is impossible for the applicant to comply with both sets of regulations. So typically conflict would arise where the federal leg legislation requires somebody to do something and municipal bylaw prohibits them from doing that very same thing. That would be a conflict. On the other hand, if the uh, federal regulation, for example, required that they have three people present on the premises and our bylaw requires two, that's not a conflict because they can comply with both requirements uh, without a conflict in the regulations. It is um, possible that the federal government will be more generous, uh, perhaps in its regulations, and allow more uh, flexibility or freedom for these type of operations, but that in itself would not create a conflict with uh, municipal bylaws unless it is something specifically permissive uh, in relation to medicinal marijuana, uh, such where, uh, that our uh, bylaws could be viewed as frustrating the federal purpose. But again, these bylaws that are proposed, be, that are before you, um, are permissive in nature, so it's again unlikely that they would be uh, of, uh, viewed as such. Thank you, and maybe I should have been more helpful in phrasing the question, and thank you for the correction um, for the way I did phrase it in the first place. So 
Toronto was referenced. I think that has put a bit of a chill, and this is my perspective, on the process. And it could be that the federal task force which is in place comes with recommendations saying that we see the future of medical marijuana dispensaries, and I recognize we might want to use cannabis, but that's the parlance that the federal government's using. Um, we see these dispensaries associated with pharmacies. So we see isn't necessarily um, directive, but we now may have gone through a process where we see standalone marijuana dispensaries not associated with uh, pharmacies. Is that a gray enough area that we're caught between? We've given an entitlement going, having gone through a, a public hearing process and allowed this land use, and we're now being constrained or, or the direction from the federal government is changing. So it, it, that's a more theoretical that I was concerned about when I was first trying to lay it out. Um, I, I think that the important part uh, to recognize is absolutely the federal regulations that are coming, at least we, we, we are led to believe that they're coming in the future, can completely change the landscape here. Uh, at the moment, everything that is addressed in these bylaws is, uh, except in some limited instances where there is licensing by uh, federal uh, government, uh, by Health Canada, uh, illegal under federal laws, and nothing that, that is being proposed um, changes that. Uh, so we are, in a way, trying to get ahead of the federal regulations, but we are not in any way uh, purporting to authorize something that the federal government uh, is currently, uh, through its regulations, prohibiting. Uh, it is if, to use the example uh, of pharmacies, if the federal government's regulations come down and say uh, uh, cannabis or marijuana can only be uh, sold through a licensed pharmacy, the result of that kind of regulation would be that uh, a, a standalone marijuana retailers, which is what is contemplated in, in, in our bylaw, would not be lawful, but any pharmacy that wanted to sell marijuana would have to also obtain a license uh, uh, as a marijuana business under the city, under proposed uh, bylaws. Thank you. Thank you. Council, more questions may come up uh, during the debate, but I don't see any more questions at this point, so I would like someone to put a motion on the table. Thanks. So, Councillor Loveday is moving the recommendation that's on the screen, and Councillor Lucas is seconding um, discussion. Yeah, uh, Councillor Loveday and then Councillor Lucas. Councillor Lucas and then Councillor Loveday. <laughs> Go ahead, Councillor Lucas. Thank you. Um, this is the difficulty that I, I'm having with this report is that, you know, a couple of the comments that have come up about, you know, for instance, the criminal, criminal record check. So for myself, who runs a liquor store, um, I have to have that done through the provincial government. And we're trying to do that. And I don't have to do that to get my business license through uh, the municipality. Um, and every year I have to to um, do a declaration that I have not been convicted of any crime during that year. Um, so, uh, has the ownership changed? Am I trying to run something else out of that store? So it's very specific, but that's done at the higher levels. And I think that's what we're missing right now and what makes this really difficult. And as Mr. Swartsky just said, you know, if they say that the pharmaceutical companies are going to do it, then, you know, there we go, all of this work, um, they're going to get shut down um, unless they are a pharmaceutical company that is properly zoned. So I, I, like, I think we're trying to bridge the gap, and I truly understand that. We have a ways to go before this is going to happen. But I, I do believe that there will be more clarity once we get those um, uh, guidelines from the federal government, just as it happens with the liquor stores and our provincial government. Thank you. Councillor Loveday? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the report. I think these, 
all of these guidelines are, are, are generally supportable. Um, may need some some fine tuning as we go through the bylaw uh, reading phases, and we get more public feedback. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that I, I think it's ridiculous that we haven't received uh, communication guidance or input from the federal government. It's really disappointing, and it's leaving us uh, making decisions in a vacuum. And the only reason we have to move forward with this has been a lack of leadership of the federal government. I understand that they have a task force. They're moving forward with this. And in the interim, we're, we're stuck trying to figure this out on our own. And we're lucky that we're going after Vancouver and we can learn from other jurisdictions uh, and from some of their mistakes. And hopefully other municipalities, uh, I know they're looking to us and, uh, and have heard positive things from, from other municipalities uh, who are looking to see what, what we do and, and learn from us and their, this learning curve. And I think if the federal government was in better communication with municipalities, we would have a better idea of where we should be going with this and uh, what our next step should be. Um, without that, we're here and we're, we're moving forward. And I think we're moving forward in the right direction. Um, in terms of enforcement, I, I, I don't want to see raids like, like in Toronto. So uh, marijuana is being legalized and we don't need any more people going to prison or getting criminal records for marijuana use. Um, and our police have more important things to do. So I'm hoping that we, we can uh, accomplish, I, I'm hoping that these cannabis businesses will become compliant on their own. And I think a lot of them have showed that they, that's exactly what they'd like to do. And if not, I'm hoping fines and other measures can do the trick. Uh, I'm a little torn on the, the lounge issue. And uh, just because I, I do know that there are patients uh, who, are, are suffering and that marijuana is how they get through their days and they're not allowed to smoke in their apartments and they're vulnerable people who could get evicted for taking their medicine in their home and if they're evicted then they end up on the street more vulnerable and sick so there there does need to be a place for them to go it, I, I understand that a a business may not be the best way to accomplish that. And so hopefully there are ways that don't fall under our business bylaw uh, that can can accomplish that. Looking at, you know, this council's on record supporting safe consumption services, I, uh, I think uh, we should probably have the same approach when it comes to people taking their medicine. So uh, I'm, I'm still a little confused about the criminal record check, but I think after that series of questions, I, I get it, and I get that it's, it's, it's not a disqualifying factor, but it, 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 there is some, some leeway for the, for the licensing officer to, to make those decisions, and I think uh, having that leeway in terms of finding out if any of these dispensaries are linked to organized crime is a very good thing. Um, so I'm, I'm actually glad to see that um, and glad that uh, the, the answers to my, my questions led me to find that more supportable. So um, I think, f yeah, for now that's it. I was also very interested to hear, uh, to learn more about ATMs and I actually didn't know any of that. So that's, that's a good, good piece of learning for me. Side benefit of the conversation. Um, Councillor Young and then Councillor Thornton Joe. Uh, thanks. Um, on the uh, whether it's marijuana or cannabis, I, I think we should stick with the federal um, wording. They may change theirs in response to some view of political correctness, but I think it would be unnecessarily confusing to have uh, a second um, terminology. Um, with regard to the, the lounges and smoking, um, the CRD um, wrestled with a lot of these issues uh, in bringing in the no smoking bylaws. Uh, a lot of people are addicted to cigarette smoke, to cigarettes, and um, uh, the medical health officer has persuaded the CRD board that the overall um, health circumstances of the community are better if smoking is tightly regulated. I don't think we want to arrive at a situation where uh, people take up smoking at, 
in the stands at the Little League baseball games or the community pools or even the bars um, on the, um, on the, uh, under the argument that they're smoking marijuana and not tobacco. And um, I don't know whether we'd get mixed, <laughs> mixed cigarettes in the future to allow people to smoke their preferred tobacco because they're at the same time smoking marijuana. I, uh, I am I'm under the understanding that the medical health officer will, in fact, be addressing this issue, presumably based on considerations of health, and that we will have, I hope, some consistency of approach with regard to smoking. Um, I, do, I do think many of the um, uh, regulations that are being put forward are sensible, uh, but I'm not able to support this um, as in the past because I think that um, our requirement of the 200 meter uh, zone between uh, marijuana outlets is um, going to add an unnecessary burden to this whole process. Our staff assure us in the report that we're legally allowed to take applications out of order or to consider them all at once for a certain neighborhood. Um, to me, given the state of flux that we're in with regard to this whole thing, the fact that um, when um, federal regulations come down, I'm sure the economic basis of these stores will will change. I think I'm sure a lot of them will find they, they can't operate under the new regulations uh, or that there's simply too much competition. I think there'll be a lot of turnover in the in the industry. I don't, I don't frankly see a lot of uh, particular concern about um, shops being located uh, near each other. I think, I think the focus on uh, schools, for example, makes a lot more sense. Um, and um, I think we are creating an unnecessary staff time burden and burden on our citizens trying to, trying to in fact, select between different applicants who want to be, um, who are going to um, put each other out of business because if one gets approved, the other is disqualified. And then, of course, just looking at the map, you can see that um, there's some not just binary overlapping, there's sort of overlapping with three or more stores. And if the middle one gets approved, the two outer ones can't go. But if one of the outer one gets gets approved. The in the middle one can't go, but the other one. I mean, it's we. Are, this is going to be a nightmare as it is. We're getting into this because we have to to eliminate the um, the harms we're seeing, and because of the constraints uh, the courts have put on our ability to uh, enforce our own uh, business bylaws. And I think um, making it more complicated than necessary is not a good, um, not a wise idea at this time. So unfortunately, I can't. And we have discussed this before, I, or I would make an amendment. But we have uh, we have discussed this before, and it's clear that I'm not on the same wavelength as my colleagues. So I'm just going to have to to oppose this. Thank you. I have uh, Councillor Thornton, Joe, Councillor Coleman, and then I'll add a few thoughts. Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you to staff for all the, the work on this. Um, in many ways, this is sort of uh, uncharted territory, and and we're trying to learn from some who have started uh, doing this, um, but I think that this is not going to be perfect right now, and I think there's going to be, we're going to find that there are things that we're going to have to change uh, as time goes on, uh, and especially when the federal government uh, gets up to speed uh, uh, with this with this issue. Um, so I do have one question in that uh, whether we should be relying on updated, uh, after the adoption, updated reporting or whether we need to have uh, uh, something in the motion to ask for an update or something at a certain time. I don't know whether we just want it to flow or whether uh, we should have a reporting back mechanism. That may be something that we may need to discuss. Uh, but just uh, also on some of the comments I want to make is I do share some of the concerns uh, that uh, Councillor Loveday mentions about uh, uh, consumption, especially for people that uh, are, um, you know are 
penalized or can't use in their apartments and, and have to find some other place to, uh, to use their medical marijuana. Uh, I think as we work towards uh, safe consumption sites, that may be an opportunity to have uh, uh, smoking rooms, which I think some consumption sites in, in other cities uh, have put in. Uh, and I guess uh, there's some comfort in knowing that if people can use uh, uh, cookies or or sprays, a tincture, uh, which I hear many people are now using, uh, that may also be able to enable them to to consume in in their homes. Uh, I'm kind of frustrated with the the smoking bylaw, and that uh, basically now you can be penalized for smoking a cigarette on a sidewalk, but then but because of we're not there yet. Uh, it's, it's not quite up to date when it comes to um, uh, the use of marijuana. Uh, where building owners are concerned, I, I do think that they have a role to play. And I, I think we've seen it in recent times, uh, recent months, when we've had an alcohol-related business that wanted to move into a building. And um, we had all the, basically, the occupants of that building basically say that they would be considering giving their notice if, if the owner uh, put this business into to the building. And so perhaps pressure needs to, if people don't want it in their building, pressure should not be going, less be going to the city, but maybe to the, to the owner of the building and saying that this is something they would support or not support in their neighborhood or in, in, in their building. Um, I do think criminal record checks uh, are important um, as we hear sometimes the concerns of uh, alcohol-related businesses and um, perhaps um, um, cannabis-related businesses being tied to or organized crime. So I think that is something that we, we do need to have in place. Um, and, I, and I guess, uh, lastly, I think this is, uh, I'm happy to be supporting this. I think this is an important step to make, uh, for the, especially for those that uh, require uh, marijuana for, and can, or cannabis to uh, be able to access it in a legal fashion. Uh, to assist with their their medical issues, I, I think you know one thing I've learned from a lot of the public meetings we've had, and since this discussion has come forward, is how many people rely on um, the use uh, for their health reasons. Uh, people that uh, you know I never would have known until they came forward and said they use it for anything for pain, for stress, for sleeping, um, um, for for various reasons. And I do recognize uh, now how important it is for individuals to be able to do it legally and not have to do it uh, behind closed doors or feel uncomfortable uh, for, for, for this use. So I really appreciate the staff working on this. I know this hasn't been easy and there's been a lot of um, like maybe gray areas or things that we still need to work out, uh, but I'm happy to support it today. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Coleman. Thank you. And I'll also start off with a thanks to staff. It, uh, sometimes feels like we're in a boxing match in a very dense fog and we're not quite sure what we're dodging or what we're stepping into. Um, it, I, I share the frustration expressed earlier that if you think back to October last year, we sent a letter to the federal government saying, please give us your direction, what, some indication of the direction you're going by February the 19th. We're still waiting. But I also think it's unfair to say, uh, the federal government hasn't done much they, or hasn't come forward with that. They do have a discussion paper that comes from the task force. It came out uh, this month. It's towards the legalization, regulation, and restriction of access to marijuana, although the principles captured within that are uh, accessing marijuana for medical purposes, so it's not the recreational side. Um, and I think that they would like responses back by August 29th. Uh, the task force then plans to to move forward, so it may be in our best interest. I am supportive of moving forward with this. Maybe it's up to us to then make sure at the August 18th meeting we capture our bylaws or our suggested bylaws and send that forward saying this is the municipal view. I know that they're interested in the municipal view. I did include a section on the task force on marijuana legalization and regulation in my councillor report um, because I think it is something that that we need to get on with. I do think that we need to reflect on why Toronto came with a harder stance, and it has some play here. One of the reasons is the uh, marijuana dispensaries in Toronto uh, were playing hard and fast. It wasn't just marijuana that was being uh, dispensed, I understand. 
Um, I hope that's not the case in Victoria. I'm not convinced that that wishful thought on my part is actually correct. Um, so I think that that comes into play and that as we move this forward and talk about potentials for public hearings, then asking those questions will be difficult and awkward, but absolutely necessary. Um, so I hope that we can uh, make this work. I think moving the staff recommendation forward does make sense, but it's not an easy road to hoe until the federal government actually, or the task force, comes with a more declarative stance. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to pick up on some of the comments that my colleagues have made. I agree. Once we've passed this, um, we should send it to the chair of the task force. Uh, is it Anne McLennan, I believe? Um, uh, and say, this is what we are doing uh, for your information. And I agree. It's, it's, we've written we've on more than one occasion to say, we're going to do this. Can you give us some input? And we've received None, no guidance at all. Uh, and probably they're hesitant to weigh in on the policy decisions of one local government when there are many local governments across Canada. But at the same time, we need to show them this is what we're doing for your information. And this is the hard work that we've done uh, in order to, to get here. Um, with regards to the 200 meter, uh, I'm, I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable that the policy is going to be left loose. I think I, I feel uh, almost in, in, in direct opposition to what Councillor Young uh, has stated uh, in this instance. We don't have liquor stores on every corner. We don't have three liquor stores on every corner. If you stand on the corner right now of Quadra and Balmoral, you can literally standing on that corner look and count three dispensaries just by standing on that corner. And we're setting up this policy because a uh, cannabis dispensary is different than a corner store or a record shop. Uh, it's a different kind of business. And so I'm, I, uh, I understand why there's flexibility in the policy, um, but I hope the council won't exercise that discretion too loosely. The 200 meter um, boundary is something that we've discussed from the beginning, and I would like to see us take that seriously. Um, I, I too am frustrated that we have to go down this road, but I think that we do. Uh, and I think this is, this is just the beginning of our work. Uh, we're going to see hopefully 38 or so rezoning applications, uh, and that's no small feat. We're going to have lots of public hearings on these and lots of public discussion. Um, I agree with Councillor Loveday that we don't want to see police raids, but I strongly uh, support us enforcing. We've spent a lot of time, energy, and effort uh, on this regulatory regime, and I quite frankly, expect that people will comply. And I expect if they don't comply, we're going to fine them $1,000 a day, and that if that doesn't work, we'll do like Vancouver's doing and seek a court injunction. We have set up a clear process, and I clearly expect people to follow it, and hopefully we'll see that happen. Um, seeing no other comments, I will uh, call the question. All those in favour? Any opposed? One opposed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Council, 